Speaker for today wears many labels. Politician, farmer, husband, father, grandfather, woodworker, Sunday school teacher, and uh, President of the United States. Historians, historians and others are attempting to label his presidency and to put a label on the man. But no analysis will come to the core of President Jimmy Carter until it examines the depth of his Christian commitment. It is on the basis of that commitment he was invited and honors us by being the featured speaker at our gathering today. Let's give a grand Thank you very much. From here, from here, it's like a Milky Way flashing around now. Are there, any, are there any Lutherans in that crowd? Well, I'm very grateful for a chance to come to one of the most exciting events that is held in our country. I was talking to our host a few minutes ago, and I hope that three years from now, this event might be held in Atlanta, Georgia, where we also have a lot of Lutherans. This morning, I want to talk to you for a few minutes about lordship, about loneliness, about purpose, about courage, about greatness. Do any of you all ever play Trivial Pursuit? Well, first of all, I don't want you to think too much of me just because I've been present. Sometimes I get quite excited about being introduced and have a big ovation, you have some sobering moments too in politics and I was feeling quite low in November of 1980 when I was defeated for re-election. And that was a year when Trigger Pursuit came out and the games were very rare and my wife was very lucky to get four two Pursuit games to give to our four children. And it made me feel very exalted to know that at least we had influence enough to get the four trigger pursuit games. <laughs> but Christmas morning, my kids were in the kitchen playing trigger pursuit, and one of them shouted, Daddy, do you know who said, when I look at my children, I wish I had remained a virgin? And And the answer, the answer was what sobered me because 
It was my mother who said that. There's another trivial pursuit question. Now, this is the last one I'll give you, but if you're playing in the future, you'll have a good start. Can you name one former president who is not buried in the continental United States? Well, I'm one of them, and uh, <laughs> President Nixon and Ford are the other two. Sometimes there is a feeling even of one who has had some success in politics or business or education or religion, to feel alone, to wonder what our purpose is in life, to feel destitute, to lack security, and to try to determine in our own lives a measure of achievement. There have now been 40 men who served as president of our country. And all of us have been quite different, one from another. I've done a lot of reading of the biographies of my predecessors in the White House in particular. And we've been there under the same basic laws and constitutional provisions. But each one of us have brought, has brought to the White House a different concept of what a nation ought to be. What is the definition of a great nation? My own concepts have really not changed. I was lucky enough to serve as a leader of the greatest nation on earth. And I often ask myself, particularly the loneliness of the White House or early in the morning in the whole office, what is there about the nation that makes it great? We're the most powerful nation on Earth, militarily. We're the most powerful nation on Earth, economically. We're the most powerful nation on Earth, politically. And how we use this tremendous power and influence is what makes a nation great. We're not great just because we have 240 million people. We're not great because we have wonderfully productive land. We're not great because we have two warm oceans on each side or because we have friendly nations north and south. It's not because other nations sometimes fear us and often respect us. We're great to the extent that we use this influence and power in a proper way. First of all, our nation ought to use this power for peace. Not only peace between ourselves and our potential adversaries like the Soviet Union, but peace for others as well. Peace in the Middle East between Jew and Arab. Between warring factions in Central America. Peace when we are not directly concerned at first with the outbreak of belligerence or war or bloodshed, but just from an adequate use of a guiding light for our nation's conscience and moral standards. When our nation degenerates into the unnecessary use of belligerence or threat or troops or warfare or bloodshed or encourages this, we betray the elements of greatness. Another measurement of greatness is a control of the greatest threat that humankind has ever known, and that is to reduce and ultimately to eliminate nuclear arsenals from the face of the earth. As president, I spent many hours, many days, studying the history of all the previous nuclear arms negotiations and dealing 
for hours on end with Ambassador Brennan and with Foreign Minister Gromyko and later with President Brezhnev in Vienna to conclude the SALT II Treaty and to strengthen the observance of existing nuclear arms agreements between ourselves and the Soviet Union and trying to prevent the proliferation of atomic explosions to other nations at present and in a power. And to the extent that our nation pursues in an unalterable way this goal, to the extent that we are known by other nations on Earth as always in the forefront of the control of nuclear weaponry, the elimination of threats that we would use space for the destruction of human beings, to that extent our nation is also great. Another measure of greatness is the enhancement of basic human rights, the promotion of human dignity, the elimination of discrimination. Our nation should always be the champion because when the most powerful nation on earth is silent, in the face of racial prejudice or hatred, the deprivation of basic human rights arises. That silence reverberates around the world. Silence on the part of the United States, silence in Washington in the face of human rights violations is what the oppressors most want to hear. Silence is what those who are oppressed most fear. We also ought to be champions of a better quality of life for people. And we should remember that just because our nation is strong and powerful and rich, because we are blessed far beyond the imaginings of generations before you and me, we should not assume that Americans are somehow superior in the eyes of God. It's sometimes hard for me to realize that a starving one of the hundreds of thousands of children in Ethiopia is just as important as my own daughter Amy. But we know that in the eyes of God, those children, all of us, are equal. And for Americans to avoid being superior or proud or believing that our blessings come because we have some favored position in God's eyes is a very important thing for us to remember. Well, these are some of the things, these are some of the concepts that concern presidents. But it's also necessary for each human being, everyone in this great auditorium, to remember that as presidents have to measure what is the greatness of a nation, so we individually have to measure what is greatness as a person. We need not ever fear that we are forgotten or lonely or unimportant because Jesus told us that whenever two sparrows, which only are worth a farthing, whenever one of those sparrows fall, it falls with God. And he goes on to say that if a sparrow is important to God, how much more are we important? And a constant realization of our own importance in the eyes of God is a strengthening factor in times of loneliness or despair or failure or frustration or disappointment or fear or uncertainty. What is a measurement of a person's greatness? In the Old Testament, there is a great deal of searching for wisdom, for truth. And the purpose of that searching quite often is, how do I as a human being enhance my status in the eyes of God? Moses, the prophets, Job, others, Question God very severely. God, why have you done this to me? God, I don't understand what I should do. I don't understand why you act as you do. Why are the wicked sometimes seemingly rewarded? Why are the righteous punished? 
some of Job's companions said, you shouldn't question God. It's sacrilegious to question God. God wants us to ask questions. As free spirits, we have a right to ask the questions that trouble us, even in the deepest and most penetrating way. This is part of our duties as Christians. If we don't understand something about our own religion, if we don't understand something about our own inner feelings, to question intently and persistently until we have an adequate answer. Sometimes the questioning might be done in private through prayer. Sometimes it might be the seeking of advice from a trusted counselor. Paul Tillich, one of the great theologians, said, religion is the search for the truth about man's existence, his relationship with God and with his fellow human beings. And he goes on to say, when we stop searching for the truth, we have lost our religion. So searching is part of the human spirit, a desire for the truth, a desire for wisdom, a desire for a proper place in God's kingdom. And the recognition that God is all powerful and that we are worthy and that he is our Lord, our protector, our creator, the inspiration for our human greatness. We have new insight since the time of Christ that gives us answers to questions that were never available to David or Solomon or Moses or Job or Isaiah, even in their most inspired moments. We have seen and we comprehend and we study and we learn about a perfect human life, a life of absolute perfection, where the priorities were proper and which gives us a guide as to the establishment of our own individual priorities. Many of us are so obsessed with human standards of achievement that although we profess to be Christians, we still forget what Christ told us to do and what Christ himself did as a perfect example. We worry about one or two homes, one or two automobiles. We worry about the design of our clothes. We worry about how far we travel. We worry about our bank account. We worry about security in our old age. Christ had no home. He had only the clothes on his back. He had no bank account. We worry about the length of our lives as perhaps the most important single concern of ours. How long is my mother and father going to live? Perhaps we've suffered the tragedy of losing a brother or sister at an early age. Christ's life was terminated at the age of 33. So as we search on our daily basis for truth, for wisdom, for guidance, for the measure of greatness, we've got the answers in the life of Christ, whose into our being as God himself was dedicated to service with a spirit of humility, a concern about others, a complete forgetfulness of self or selfish promotion. So Christ came to give us words and to give us actions which are as vivid and alive today as they were 2,000 years ago. Christ came as a revolutionary. He had only been preaching and ministering for a few days before the rulers, the leaders, the church leaders of that day decided this man must die because his message is too shocking, it's too irrational. 
as measured by our human standards. And the message of Christ is still revolutionary if we cling to those priorities which are normally accepted in a modern, secular, wealthy, rich, and secure society. As Christians, however, we are constrained by God to seek truth and wisdom, even though the words are revolutionary, even though they do disturb us. And as we make decisions on an individual, even on our own basis in our life, how should I react to the situation if we say to ourselves, how would Jesus act? It might make us do things that are not too enjoyable at the time as far as our own self-promotion is concerned. But it will lead us inexorably, inevitably, toward true greatness. Each day, it's incumbent on us as those who have been especially blessed with security, with wealth, with education, with influence, not only to serve others, but to expand. To expand our minds to encompass more of God's world. What is going on around me? Why do things happen as they do? How can I comprehend the events that impact on my life, on the lives of those I love? How can I expand my mind? And also, how can I expand my heart? How can my heart be expanded to love more deeply and to love more broadly? How can the community of those I love be made greater? I've known a lot of people in my life. I've known young people your age, 15 to 18 years old, already old, already beginning to atrophy, already having reached the peak of growth and achievement, not willing to take a chance, not willing to expand one's life, not willing to reach higher or to accomplish more. Already old at the age of 18, I've known people still quite young at the age of 80 who rose each morning from the bed, eager to face another day, another day of opportunity, another day filled with love and concern and compassion and service and concern and friendship. So, a measurement of greatness is the expansion of influence in life after we decide what that influence should be. One of the questions that we ask ourselves, particularly those of us who are timid, and I have been very timid at times in my life, very fearful about the future. What if I fail? What if I try something and fail? What if I fall flat on my face? What will my friends say? What will those who observe me say? What will the news media say? What will the headlines be? He tried this and ridiculously failed. He must be a fool, or he must be weak, or he must be incompetent if he failed. And so we fear failure, which is one of the great constraints on the expansion of our lives. We must be willing to face ridicule. If we're not risking now or in the future failure because of some notable or worthwhile effort, then we have no faith. Because we know from the Bible that with God everything is possible. Dylan Thomas is my favorite poet. Perhaps you've read his poems. I and my wife and my children read his poems and diagram sentences in them and, and study them and memorize them. The first Dylan Thomas poem I ever said, read was 
refusal to mourn the death of our father child in London. The last line is what caught my attention. It said, after the first death, there is no other. After the first death, there is no other. On this earth, we have one life to live. And, and how do we live it? That is what measures the greatness of a human life. One of the greatest people I've ever known, and I've known the leaders of almost all the nations on earth, I've known great scientists and great educators. One of the greatest people I've ever known is a man named Millard Fuller. 95% of you, maybe more, have never heard his name. Millard Fuller was a poor young boy in Alabama who went and paid his way through law school. He was a very eager and aggressive and exciting student. He began to go around to the dormitories and collect the laundry of other students, and he would send it off to the laundry and bring it back and put it before their doors and charge a small fee. He took up recipes from other students and published a cookbook. And by the time he finished law school, he was one of the largest cookbook publishers in the nation. He formed a very lucrative law practice in Montgomery, Alabama. And in a few years, he was a multimillionaire. He owned a large farm, he owned some very fine horses, two foreign automobiles, a speedboat, had a wife, Linda, and two lovely daughters. And one day his wife, Linda, came to Millard and said, Millard, I can't live this life anymore, I'm leaving you. And she went to New York to a marriage counselor. He soon followed her up there. To make a long story short, they decided to change their life. They gave away every penny that they owned. And he moved down to a farm named Cornelia Farm near Plains, Georgia, near about nine miles from where I live. And he began to build homes for poor people in need. Later he went to Zaire as a missionary and there continued to build homes for poor people in need. And eight or nine years ago, he formed what was known, now known as Habitat for Humanity. He's an inspired worker. We are now building in Habitat one home every day for poor people in need. We're building a home every week in Haiti. We finished 500 homes in Zaire alone, with an average occupancy of 10. I would guess that Habitat for Humanity's bank account is almost zero because Willard Fuller does everything on faith. We began to rebuild 19 apartments in lower Manhattan with a total ultimate cost of $700,000 with no money in the bank. And those homes will be finished at the end of this year. Willard Fuller is an inspired person who tries to pattern his life after that of Christ. He makes his mistakes, of course, he's fallible and human. But to me, when people say, what is greatness? Who is the greatest person you've ever met? I maybe think about Anwar Sadat and a few others like that. But I would say that at the top of the list would be Millard Fuller. Well, greatness is measured in the eyes of God not our contemporary human beings. But as far as we individually are concerned, greatness has to first be measured by us. I have to decide what is a great life. If I want to expand my life, if I want to be great, what must I do? Is it to acquire extraordinary wealth? Or is it to act as Millard Fuller and many others have acted in the name of Christ. I know that you are very young, but perhaps you would think in your own mind just for a quiet moment, in the last 12 months, what have I done of direct benefit 
for others that required a genuine sacrifice on my part. And another question you might ask, when was the last time that I spent one hour in prayer, explaining to God what my life is and asking God's help in deciding what my life ought to be. Quite often for me and perhaps for you, those two questions are quite embarrassing. Because we can go from one day, one week, one month, one year, one decade, one life, always postponing to the future a chance when I will bear my soul before God and say, these are my strengths, these are my weaknesses, these are my doubts, these are my fears, these are my hopes, my ambitions, my dreams. Help me. And we can also go for days or a lifetime without ever making one single genuine sacrifice for others. And, and if this happens, what has happened to our dream of a great life? Well, we should seek wisdom through every possible avenue. We should make sure that our wisdom is derived from God. And as young, excited, dedicated Lutherans, you, you have an insight into the words of truth. We must trust ourselves. Not put self-imposed limits on our lives because no one can really limit your life except yourself. We can acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus. Not in a transient Sunday morning way, but in a repetitious ultimately perhaps even a continuing way. And we can also never be fearful to reach for greatness. Measured by a perfect standard of the life of Christ, the Lord of us all.
We have enough buses and we need you to be patient with us. And so this morning we're going to ask that we have all the shuttles you need to go downtown to be a part of the Habitat and workshops and forums and Denver Encounter. And we need just to be patient with us. So Howard is here. We're going to sing a little bit and we're going to release you by sections of the auditorium to go to your buses. So if you would please be patient. We had some people last night who came very close to being seriously injured because we were rushing and shoving and pushing and doing all of that sort of thing. So, if you bear with us, we'll have you out of here very shortly. The buses are ready to roll. So, as Howard continues to sing, I'm going to ask that those people who are seated behind me, right here, you may go to your buses. Okay, and rest of you, Howard.